everybody. Who those 16 playwrights are. 
because since we're all local folks here, some of them are going to know us. And then I, I want to be brief so that we can keep moving through. So the first class of residents playwrights was Brian Thornstenson, Garrett Gronfeld, Eugenie Chan, Julia Jarko, Peter Nachtrieb, and Maricela Orta. The second class is Aaron Bregman, Tanya Schaefer, Aaron Loeb, Chris Chen. The third, Lauren Gunderson, Kate E. Ryan, Andrew Saito, Geetha Reddy. The fourth is um, Janako Fudge and Jonathan Spector. So that's who they are. They are in a rotating, they come in on a rotating basis, and Kate can talk about this as well, um, so that there's an overlap and the, the fellows and the cohorts can support each other. So one, one class doesn't end, they're, they're in rotation. They have monthly meetings, and we can also address that. So that's the broad strokes of the program. They do get a stipend. <laughs> well, my residency at Cane Bell involves lots of eating and drinking <laughs> with Rob Melrose. <laughs> um, and then, I guess, there's some playwright on the fringes of that. <laughs> um, so, I, I mean, I'm very honored and privileged because I, my job description, my primary job description is to write plays. Also, I mean, there's some teaching of playwriting at Cutting Ball, and um, some translation of plays from Portuguese and now Spanish this year. And what else? What else would you say? <laughs> Um, yeah, even into your brain, Rob. Yes. Well, and kind of community building, and also um, um, you've been great at uh, bringing other new playwrights to us. The other, you know, um, and that, that's been a big thing. Um, we're we, Cutting Ball has, you know, we, our our mission is to develop experimental new plays and reinvision classics, and we've actually been centered. I mean, you know, so we got the classical bent, but We've also been centered on playwrights from the beginning, and especially on a residency. So we, when we started, um, Kevin Oakes was, was our resident playwright. We did two plays of his. We did Drowning Room, and um, uh, 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 we, Mr. Bujama's was Electric Beach, and The Vomit Talk of Ghosts. And then um, we also um, had four years with um, Eugenie Chan, and did um, and did and, and did, we developed a number of plays um, with her from the very beginning, and wound up doing three full productions uh, of hers. And it's interesting because this is back in a time when we had no money, we had we had no extra money. We 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 of course paid playwrights for their their show. I mean, what what what, what we the residency was kind of a promise to give the playwright a space and and kind of. Work, work with them and you know get, guarantee them a production, uh, which I mean as playwrights who write plays know, it's being guaranteed a production is a is a big big deal because um, a lot of playwrights have playwrights that have plays in their um, drawer that they'd love to you know have have in a full production but just don't get that um, that opportunity. So that's a that, that's a big thing, and um, and. This is when we did, didn't have much money, and then the, um, the Mellon Foundation had this wonderful, um, as a result of outrageous fortune, they wanted to fund a full-time staff member who would be a resident playwright, and um, based on um, our relationship that we already had going with, um, with Andrew, and I think the fact that we had been doing this from, from the beginning, it allowed us to create an even more robust uh, version, and it's been it's been exciting to have um, hand, have Andrew be a part of our day to day lives. And what's been um, what's been awesome about it is having having Andrew as a full time staff member. You know, he thinks about things from the playwright's perspective, and um, oftentimes we'll be planning things, and I realize I'm I'm seeing everything from a director's perspective. And all of a sudden, Andrew will chime in, and I'll realize, ah, oh, it's it's another artistic voice, but he's actually coming from a completely different perspective. So I, I'll I'll be brief. Uh, actually, I, I guess I haven't been brief. <laughs> but forget it. I I, 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 I I'm acted. But anyway, I, I'll stop with the promise that I will talk more if if if, if asked. <laughs>
And no matter who you're producing, if you're only producing two voices a year, I'm sorry, you're not diverse. You're not inclusive. Um, and so we, the, the issue that came out of Outrageous Fortune that we felt that we as an ensemble company were uniquely equipped to address was this feeling of disempowerment of playwrights, the fact that they, they were voicing um, a feeling like they had no place at our artistic decision-making tables. Um, as a bottom-up ensemble company, where the artistic decisions are made by a literary committee composed of our associate, uh, our associate artists, we felt like we were uniquely um, in a position to definitely empower, empower some writers. So we created, out of one-on-one -on -one conversations with Bay Area playwrights, um, Alter Lab, which supports uh, three to five writers a year. Um, and the playwrights are required to write a new play, to identify and take a creative risk, either with their work, with their process, whatever that means to them, and to support their fellow writers. Everything else is set each year by the writers themselves based on um, what they need to achieve their goals. Um, the, the thing that worried me with the program was that maybe Alter Theater would be supporting these amazing playwrights and none of them would be writing plays that would be appropriate for Alter Theater to produce because we produce in weird venues, we don't, we don't, we don't have a proscenium stage, we barely have lights. Um, but as it turns out, uh, we produced three out of the four uh, plays that were written in our first year. And we've got plans where we are, we're currently producing one of the plays from the second year, Bobo by Demo Everheim, um, which Jane was the dramaturg on. And uh, uh, our commission by Larissa Fast Horse uh, is also on the docket for production in 2014 2015. So all of my fears about the program have not come true. And <laughs> oh my gosh, it's been so much more successful than I ever dreamed. And one of the plays that, well, the very first play to be produced out of the Alter Lab residency was Anne's play. Did that answer? Yes. I feel like yes. Rob, like I talked way too much. Well, they all said. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, so I, uh, well, we'll do it together. We'll do it together. <laughs> this is um, how our day goes. Yeah. <laughs> uh, I'll say that I guess, I mean, my relationship with Z Space started nine or ten years ago, um, when I was invited, uh, I got a, a different, a Tarnasol Emerging Playwrights Residency, which doesn't exist anymore, but it was, there was four of us, um, and we, we were given uh, an invitation to work at Z-Space, work on a play, um, and I just remember um, David Dower at the time was like, you are welcome to come here anytime you want. This is before Z-Space had actually like a space, um, had space, but it was office space. And that was it. And there was a couple of rehearsal studios. And the invitation was just to come in and write at any time um, you wanted. And there was always either a, a weird like back seat of a van you could sit on and write. And if the rehearsal rooms weren't being rented, you could go sit in there. There was a conference room. And I kind of, it was right at the end of my grad school and I, um, at SF State, and I kind of never left. Mm -hmm. um, and sort of kept going there to work. Um, at the same time, there was also like eight theater companies sh sharing office space, so it was a chance to meet a lot of people. And I think it was either through that, this is when I first met Lisa. Um, I think I, and then I started sending you stuff. Yeah, um, yeah still, uh, Lisa was artistic director of Encore Theater, which you, you still sort of are. Yeah. Right, right. <laughs> I negotiated myself. Yeah, so, so then, and then Lisa came, and then we, then we, through Encore, we, we worked together, and Lisa commissioned a play of mine with a Gerboni grant, and then um, Lisa took over Z Space, and then Z Space got a Space Space. And <laughs> I remember, I like that the Arena Theater all of a sudden, um, not all of a sudden, but they, they decided to do these playwright residencies there that, through the Mellon Foundation that are. These are initial first models of, of the one that um, we eventually got. And I yeah. remember pitching to you, can we get one of those? Um, and we actually I think wrote, I wrote a grant, we wrote to, a grant to Mellon and didn't get it. Um, and then when they have this, had this pilot program, which we're both part of, which there's 14 theaters across the country that have these Mellon Foundation funded resident playwrights. Um, we were invited to submit an application now I hang out there a lot.
Uh, so I, um, uh, it's, a, it's a three year residency. Uh, uh, they're all salaried. Um, I, I go there, I have a desk, um, and I, I write there. I, I'm working on a couple different projects. I go to staff meetings once a week um, and contribute not, well, weird things. I yeah. think more of a, a joke or something, and then I move on to the budget. Uh, and I, um, I've, I've been sort of sometimes watching shows, taking notes sometimes, I've been reading scripts, and uh, they're going to produce my play in November um, called The Totalitarians, and then, and then we're working on a play that's going to be specific commissioned for Z-Space that we're kind of harnessing the actual potential of this giant former can factory uh, and how I can use that. Um, knowing where I'm going to write the play for, how I can use that to develop the play. And then, and then, and sort of, I don't know, it's evolving. I, I feel like we're, yeah. we're, we're sort of amorphous and loose and discovering ways that we're helping each other. Yeah. And it's similar to Cutting Well, it's a very organic relationship. Um, and like Peter said, that he's been involved with Z-Space for the past 10 years. Um, and it really, uh, there's no, really, anything we do at Z-Space, there's no real cookie cutter. I would say, um, and same with the residency. Uh, but I think we have to have, um, when we brought Peter in and we were talking about the residency, making sure that our goals aligned and the desires aligned and that it was something that was gonna help him as well as Z-Space. And for me personally and for our, our organization, putting a, uh, an artist really in the center of the organization and having him be there on a daily basis has shifted the organization as it should be shifted, I think, when you put an art, artist center to it, because that is who we are ultimately serving. And on numerous occasions, I've gone to Peter and asked him as a playwright for, um, uh, for I'm going to say here, um, to help me with certain situations that I didn't understand how to maybe approach as an administrator or a producer. Um, I think of myself as an artist, as a producer as well, but from his perspective as a playwright, I had certain situations and said, you know, bounced things off of him, and he gave me, you know, he helped me with those ideas and suggestions. He wrote our um, fundraising letter this past fall for our campaign. Um, again, coming from an artist or a playwright's point of view, how um, our, our uh, constituency can help and give it back to our organization and the impact that we have on our community. Um, in preparation for this panel, we got to have a, a conference call that we were uh, sort of circling around some ideas that we thought folks might want to hear about and that were central to the residency experience. And one of them just being um, residencies as the perception of residencies as a closed club. Like if you don't know who to ask, you can't get one, or or the path the path to residency being through relationship. And you guys described your relationship really well. How it, it it's a time lapse thing. Oh, and yeah. Well, yeah, I would say that, I mean, a residency is such a amorphous, not a concrete term at all. It's, yeah. it's, a, it's actually just a word for a relationship between a, a playwright and a theater, and that can be defined in so many different ways. And I think for us, it was, um, we were looking together for ways to, to advance that forward. Yeah. And when this opportunity came to apply for this grant, we applied for it together. So that's, that's sort of, yeah. in, that, in that way, that's how we just find, you can find a theater before you find the money, um, yeah. or, or, you know, there's a lot of different ways to, to get where you, to get that relationship going. Yeah. And I think that, that method of applying for really uh, is in keeping with their philosophy of putting people together as teams. You can't just be a theater and apply for funding and then go look for a playwright. You have to come together as a team before it even starts, mm -hmm. and then propose your ideas together. Um, what about Ultra Theater? How the, the playwrights in your current Ultra Lab, what is, what is the relationship path that led them to this? And can people apply? Uh, there's not an open application, but um, the, the way that it happens really is, again, through relationships. Um, one of the ways in which we empower our playwrights is that after you've been a resident writer, you are then able to recommend writers for the future groups and the resident writers have a big say in who gets to come in next. Partly because they've been through it already, um, so they, they have a good sense of who their peers are and who it might work well for and who it would be pleased 
don't go there. <laughs> you know, because um, not every residency is right for every writer. You really have to find the right match. Um, and do you want to talk a little bit about how you came to it? You certainly had a... Um, my memory is that, and this may contradict me if this is not what you think, the, there was a play reading committee who read and read and read and read <laughs> and met together every now and again and read one or two plays that we were considering. And that was a very cumbersome to me process. Um, and Jeanette had this idea of starting <coughs> the residency program. I was lucky enough to be one of the first people in it. My experience before that as a playwright had been when I was six years old and I would write one every Sunday. And my best friend and I would perform it for our parents on Sunday night. I have no idea what this place was about. <laughs> but it was a terrific feeling to think something and see it there and see it heard. Um, what I love about the program that is involved is we meet three times a year for two solid days. And during that time, we can virtually do what we want, but in addition to that, we have actors. If we want to hear something, we tell Jeanette, I want to hear Act 1, Act 2, how I've got a terrible outline for 3, and I want to listen to it. We have actors available. And some of those actors stay with us right through the process, reading it again and again and again. And last, when was my done? Last year? No, yes. Last March. Um, Jimmy Dean had read every single reading all the way and knew he wanted well, wasn't I ever lucky. Um, that time spent around the dining room table, uh, writing for 25 minutes, or having somebody say, I'm stuck, and here is where I'm stuck. Um, in the play that I have done. Uh, there were two dreams in it for two different people. One dream was there and fine. I could not find the other dream. And Maricela picked up a book out of my bookcase and said, look at the pictures. And like six pages in, there was the dream. Or the scene and there has been a you know, terrific interchange between those of us in the lab. At the end of the first year, we did a wrap up. And I said to Jeanette, can I come back? <laughs> and I don't think you'd ever thought about that. <laughs> we agreed that Anne is grandfathered in. She can do the playwright residency program as many times as she likes. <laughs> and I, wa I want to say it just, this is not self aggrandizement <clears throat> It's thanks to the program. The play I wrote uh, has been read in New York in a public reading, and I'm now rewriting part of it as a result of that, and it has been considered a production in New York. I would never have got there without this program. And now I've got a great big lump of a second show. And it's coming together. 
but I wasn't trying to rewrite the other one. Well, a permanent residency is a great idea. Yeah. Right? <laughs> well, this, this is it's nice for like another residency right yeah. here. <laughs> but I like what Anne is saying about the um, support yes. of the cohort team and how that um, camaraderie and mutual support had, had worked for you. And at the Playwrights Foundation, um, they have a monthly meeting and they uh, offer a lot of uh, sort of similar types of things. And I uh, would like to ask Kate about how um, that support comes and how the monthly meetings are. I don't think that you bring in actors unless uh, on rare occasions. Is that right? That's right. You, I think if you really feel strongly that you want actors to read when it's your turn to present something, you could. But um, there's something really nice about having it just be writers. And sometimes I think if you're presenting a new play that no one's ever read before, it can be nice sometimes when people aren't making huge acting choices, um, that it's literally just being read the words first. Um, and so it functions well that way. And it's um, the Playwrights Foundation residency is um, uh, hugely about just playwrights supporting each other. And, and Andrew is in the um, residency right now with me. And, um, the Playwrights Foundation really provides opportunities for us and is also open to us kind of figuring out what we need as a community. Um, for example, we've been meeting sometimes out of the um, residency on like Friday mornings just to get together and write at a coffee shop. Mm -hmm. Really simple things like that um, that we know will help us. Um, and going to see shows together and just sharing opportunities, grants. Um, so the community aspect, I think, is really wonderful and that's something that um, I've been a part of in other times in my life that haven't, haven't necessarily been through residency that I feel like playwrights usually get a lot out of just getting together. Um, that peer, that <coughs> peer support and also with the monthly meeting does that um, self-motivate? I mean does that give you uh, an opportunity to have a deadline or is it not deadline oriented? Um, it is deadline oriented, which I think is also very helpful. Um, and uh, we're, we're expected to write a full length play each year that we're in the residency, which people are generally doing anyway, but it's um, great if you're looking for some kind of structure within that um, to know that you have certain deadlines and that people are going to be there and expect you to bring something substantially because they're taking their time um, to be there and listen, provide feedback. Um, so that, that's a big part of it. So to be clear about the Playwrights, uh, Playwrights Foundation has uh, brings in four new playwrights every two years. So certainly if you're a Bay Area, they also have an emerging, you can be considered for a residency if you're an emerging playwright. So you would want to um, talk to the staff at, at uh, Playwrights Foundation more about that. But if you're interested, and particularly now, as I mentioned before, that they're looking at feeling that it's been very successful and they're, they're, they are moving past this pilot phase and they are developing a, a little bit of a different structure. I would just stay in touch with them if you're interested, but um, one of the nice things about it is there, there is a certain amount of uh, breadth in how many. I love the one-on-one -on -one and I think it's an incredible mm -hmm. opportunity and that's great and then I love this, mm -hmm. this peer support and the uh, just more playwrights being able to um, have opportunities. Another thing that the Playwrights Foundation offers in its program is help with marketing. If you're interested in marketing and looking at that, um, they will help you review your grant applications and the staff or Amy will work with you on grant applications and um, just help you get that right because obviously that's what Amy does most of the time is write grants and write grants and I'm sure Lisa and, and Jeanette know all about that. It also, the program also offers dramaturgical support should you want it. Um, I think that, I know Ultra Theater does that too if you, if you want it. So um, they have a studio which Kate had said that you can use 
and uh, they use it for the monthly meetings and then they use it to get together. But I like that you're saying now you're going outside of that and, and meeting yeah. together. It has that flexibility um, where if, if, and Amy has said to us, you know, if there's a particular develop, like professional development opportunity you're, you're, you're interested in, I can help you do that. Um, so there's a lot of flexibility within that, I think sort of depending on who is there and, and what each of us needs. So what, uh, before, before this point, the relationship path has been more informal of just being around the Rights Foundation and then landing in the residency, but is there someone now who people can contact? Yes, they can contact um, Marissa Katubig Niles. That's three names. Uh, Marissa, C A T U B I G Niles, N I L E S, and she's the RPI coordinator. And I'm so glad I had that answer. A <laughs> student. <laughs> so, from the writers, um, a lot of a lot of the planning of residencies is about an artistic home, like a sense of an artistic home. And that, it's clear, has shaken out very differently among the residencies. Like, it seems like the residencies that have more playwrights um, aren't necessarily in the artistic staff meeting, like having that sort of season planning level of responsibility, but they have this kind of support. Um, it can go it can, on the spectrum, on the spectrum. Or, or maybe they are, but like what, what from the writers, um, does the artistic home that this residency provides feel like? <laughs> uh, well, I mean, it, it, it feels like a real home to me. It, and, um, and it's fun to think about. It's fun to be a playwright and not have your only duty be to write the play. Um, and that you can lend a sort of perspective or thought or insight to a whole realm of different things. As, as a playwright, it's not your primary mission for, or reason for living on the planet. Mm -hmm. And I like that, because I, I can't write all the time, and I like to think of funny drink names sometimes. <laughs> and, or they're, they're, they're not all that trivial, there's other responsibilities that I like. <laughs> <laughs> it's fun to have a, a sort of, a, taking a global sense of what does it mean to be a writer or a playwright, and what does that bring to a whole other Things that happen at a theater company. What's your favorite thing that you get to do? Right. <laughs> uh, I think the drink names have been really fun. Yeah. Yes, yes. Gin, friend Gin friendships. Gin friendships for, for a friendship. That was really easy. But uh, I'll keep, I'll keep working on them. Yes. Also, yeah. I think sometimes the, the, the casual conversations that always happen, in, in a, especially in an open, open seating area like C space, like that. Of cross pollination is really nice, um, and hearing different different insights from all sorts of different parts of the organization has been really great. What about you, Anne? Ask me the question again. <laughs> the, artist, the artistic home that the residency provides. What components about it are the most meaningful for you? Um, to be considered worthy of being in that place. And focusing on just the doing of it. I, by profession, have been a director for a very long time. And while it helps you in many technical ways about how things will work, it doesn't give me that feeling of I'm creating the whole thing myself. And I, I do a lot of um, what is called lucid dreaming. And I have dreamt chunks of stuff that I've written and got up out of bed and got straight to the computer. And to be able to show that intimate stuff to other people and have them comment in a helpful, loving, sometimes critical, but in a way that is very supportive. 
It's enabled me to go comfortably to where my greatest source is. I mean, I the first play I wrote for there. I had this dream of the title and the girl and the first line. And I knew everything about her. And I got out of bed and went to the computer and did that. So I had something to say, who are you? Where did you come from? Who are your parents? What do you think? Instead of a blank page. And you also serve on the literary committee and you get to choose the season for the next year and identify writers and yeah. all sorts of other stuff too. Uh, they, the literary committee at Altered Theater is comprised of um, seven to 11 associate artists each year. And we have two writers from our um, residency program who serve on that, and is one of them. And at Alter Theater, we don't have an artistic director. We're a bottom-up ensemble company. It's the literary committee that makes the decisions on which writers get chosen for the residency and which projects get greenlit for production and development. And Anne is a, a huge voice in that. What about you, Andrew? Well, I can't. Your residency, what's uh what parts of that artistic home have ended up being meaningful? Well, first thing that comes to mind is the amazing gold-rimmed chair from Rose production of Susan Lawrence Parks' play, The Dead of West. My <laughs> man, that everyone complains about is only going to get rid of for years, but it's my favorite chair in the world. Like, in San Francisco. It's a literal chair? Okay. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Um, <laughs> Um, I can't imagine. It no, really looks like it looks like a drone. It, it, it's the, it was the chair of the Queen, then Pharaoh, um, oh. Hatch of Sun. No, I, I remember, remember that. that chair. Yeah. Yeah. I remember yeah. that, that like work, seeing that chair. Yeah. Um, no, I really thought since like years ago I had thought, thought about writing that play about the fair Queen, the really woman good. Pharaoh. Yeah. Um, Wonderful. But I can't imagine a more fitting or a more fitting artistic home than Cutting Ball. Because um, Cutting Ball has been described by some people as very strange, and those same words have used to, to describe me. I'm wonderfully strange. Yes, thank you. Yeah. Um, so, just a couple things on that. So, my very first production outside of grad school was Christy Critters and the Scarlet Art, which Rob produced and directed last year. And it's the play that when I wrote it, and every time I looked at it for several years, I thought, who's ever going to do this? No one's ever going to do it. Right? And then Rob did it. He, he made it happen beautifully. And, um, and so I think, I can't tell you how many times, especially in grad school, I was told to write naturally mm -hmm. and to write differently and to write um, um, more conventional, right? And to, oh, this, this is unpro unproducible. Oh, this doesn't make any sense. All of these things. And then um, I hear the opposite from Rob. And my, my newest play, which I'm still very much working on, um, when we had meetings over earlier drafts, he told me to make, he said, make it more like Crispy Critters. <laughs> You know, and make it more like Crispy Critters had this um, old woman who would have uh, animals like gorillas and giraffes come out of her ear. Um, so, so it's basically make make it more like a play that only Andrew Sight does. Exactly. Yeah, yeah. And, and so I, I really appreciate it because I feel like, and also I feel like Rob was making a huge commitment, and Kenny Lawler are making a huge, including the board, are making a huge commitment to my growth as a writer in my body of work and the evolution of that in a way that I don't think is possible if you, oh, you get a commission from South Coast Rep or you get a commission from this or that theater. And while those are wonderful, you know, necessary things, the relationship is totally different. And um, I'd also say that it's also a very satisfying artist to come because I've learned, I've learned so much in this first year of the residency about theater and what theater can be. And, um, you know, I, I, one of my big 
theatrical influences. Perhaps the biggest one is a Peruvian theater collective called Villa Chani, and I've spent, seen many of their shows and, and um, worked, studied with them, and worked with them, and then, but um, in, in getting to know me, I wanted to work with me, he, he and Suzanne Appel, the managing director of fundraised to bring um, Teresa Raleigh, one of my former teachers and a core member of the Chani, up to San Francisco to work with the cast and Christmas Critters. And, um, so I, that's sort of my background, but Rob has a deep, um, he's deeply knowledgeable about European theater, particularly Poland above all, but also Russia and Germany, and, and you know, in love with Spielberg. And so I feel like I'm getting an amazing theater education. I, 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 wanted, I wanted to talk a little bit about strangeness, because you, know, you would ask the question, how do writers come to us? And they usually come to us through our um, Risk Is This festival. And um, you know, our, our mission is to produce um, experimental plays. And, and in some ways, that puts me in an interesting position, because there are a lot, I mean, I love, I love Ibsen, and I love um, Chekhov. I think they're wonderful writers. And I love all, you know, a lot of the playwrights who decide to follow in, in their footsteps. Um, but a question I get to ask is, what about the people who are following in Beckett's footsteps? Mm -hmm. What about the people who are following in Ionesco's footsteps? What are the people, what are the people who are following in Richard Stein's or um, Cesare Parks' footsteps? Or what, are, what, are, what about the people who are doing something completely different? And, and so I get, I get to ask the question, how, how can I support those playwrights? And I, I've, I've been a part of the literary committees, and I've worked for a, a lot of Playwrights festivals I greatly admire, like Playwrights Foundation and like um, the, uh, the Playwrights Center in Minneapolis. And um, but what, what I noticed would happen sometimes is that um, there'd be these weird plays, these strange plays, like um, Andrew talked about, and there'd be two or three people on the committee who would just love these plays, and the rest would be like, oh, I, I don't know. And those plays often would never make it to the final round. And now Amy Mueller and I have a great relationship. She she like sends those plays to me and says, you know, there were a couple of people who loved this play and you should look at it, but it didn't it, it, it didn't go all the way. And then and then um, so so we're actually on the lookout for these plays that other theaters might not uh, might not produce. And and risk is this it, it, we we give five plays a week long workshop, and that winds up being kind of a, a starting point for playwrights and cutting ball and. Out of that can grow a full production, like the Crispy Critters, and out of that can grow a residency. And certainly, Christine Evans' Trojan Bart, the yes. that I worked on, has had a, a life all over yeah. the world. Yes, it went, went to and ARG and beyond. Yeah. yeah. So, Kate, your uh, artistic home, um, my favorite thing. Um, yeah, what's most painful for you? in the 
uh, and I remember that play very well, and I, I loved it. Um, so being a part of the festival then led you to being a part of um, the residency. But I like that there is also um, rejection involved in the story. <laughs> yeah. You know. yeah, it's it's not it's very rarely I think just an easy meet each other done. You know, it's, it, there's a lot that goes into these relationships. I think. And yeah, rejection is part of that sometimes. But it has a happy ending. Yeah, very happy or it's ending. In, yeah. it's, it's in a it's in a happy middle. Yeah. Oh, absolutely. <laughs> I think you know if, if you keep keep going and keep doing this, I think usually you do come to a place um, where things make make sense after a while. Well, we've got 20 minutes left. I would love to hear what folks, what you guys are thinking, what questions you have for our amazing panelists. Yeah, you are amazing panelists. Okay. Thank you, folks, very much. <laughs> um, my name is Anna. I'm a local playwright, and. Um, I'm really interested in your thoughts about how to how parents can create relationships with um, literary managers, producers, and directors. Um, because as you were pointing out, we playwrights work in silence on our own, in solitude. Boy, do we ever, you know, it's a lot of work to birth one of these full-length plays. Um, and you know, the traditional point of contact, of course, is a submission process, right? It, it, horrible for you guys, horrible for us. Don't do it. Don't bother me. <laughs> yeah, I'm serious. Absolutely. I have got, for years, I have a stack of rejection letters, and it's fine, I'm plowing through, but it's not a very positive process for either end. So, um, alternate ways that we playwrights can get to know people on the producing end. Um, I've got one idea in which I talk to artistic directors and say, hey, what do you really wish someone would write a play about? What, what do you want on your stage? Give me two months, I'll give you two scenes and an outline, we'll do a stage reading. That's one way. Um, do you have any other ideas? I, I, I'll just, um, I can't tell you how much it is about relationships. Mm -hmm. And it's also, I think it's really important for the playwright to know who they're pitching to and mm -hmm. what kind of work that organization does. Um, I probably take at least two meetings a week with playwrights and artists from all over the place. That's way more than most people. Probably, mm -hmm. um, but that's really important to me, um, to get to know them, to get to know their work. Um, and, and vice versa, it's really important that the playwright really gets to know the organization's work. For you to come see the work that's happening in my space, to understand who the staff is, to know who Peter is, to, to look at the history of the kind of work that I do, and if you figure out it's not, we don't kind of have a certain aesthetic, don't waste your Move time, on, right. really. Just don't waste your time with it. Or you know, you find out there's something that really fits with, with cutting balls aesthetic and their mission. Submissions don't even bother with it, as far right. as I'm concerned. I don't have a literary uh, manager. A lot of the plays that come to me are from people I know, or Peter tells me about, or Rob tells me about, or Andrew, or Kate, mm -hmm. or Jane, mm -hmm. or Jeanette, or Anne. I count on my peer group to send them. A lot come through agents as well who know the type of work that I'm looking um, so, uh, so I really, again, for me, submissions don't even work. I, I, I won't read them, <laughs> and it's a waste of your time and your money. I don't know how you yeah, feel. I, I would absolutely emphasize and uh, completely agree with that. The other thing that I would say is that if you as a playwright haven't been to see a play at my theater, please don't submit because mm. you don't know what we're doing. Mm. You know, it's that yeah. simple. We perform in non-traditional spaces. Our work is very stripped down, um, and <laughs> If you, if you don't know us, why should I spend the time to get to know you? Um, however, if you come to see the show, there's probably about a 70% chance that I will personally be there. So feel free to come talk to me. Or Anne will be there. There will always be a member of our literary committee at one of our shows. So come get to know us because I, I can't emphasize enough how much I want to. I want to love your voice, and I also want to get to know you as a person because our company is really committed to supporting your creative growth, and I have to both believe in you as a human being and in you as an artist. But I think it's a, a really good point about knowing where, like Rob was talking about, the type of work that he does, or with Jeanette, you wouldn't want to submit a play to Alter Theater unless. If you didn't want it done in rocking chairs, then you really shouldn't do it. But the first play that I went to at Alter Theater was done in a store called the Rocking Chair Store. And all of the audience sat around and rocked. That's going to drive you crazy. 
then you shouldn't do it. I thought it was great. Um, and it, it was very interesting and exciting. So in her way, that's a, that's sort of an experimental theater too, or altered, or alternative. But I, I love the idea that you, um, that submissions can be um, not a great use of your time, yeah. and that because these theaters and producers and artistic directors that are sitting here are really asking you to come and and come and participate and be in their uh, be in their spaces. Yeah. The other thing for me at D Space is that I rarely will take a play that has comes that is handed to me. Even mm -hmm. if we're sitting down and you say, "Here's a play," that I I rarely do that because for me it's much more about commissioning and developing and then producing. And I don't always produce the commission or the development. Sometimes I'll, it's different. Um, so again, that's understanding who you're pitching to and, and what kind of work that you think that they're going to want to hear. Yeah. Well, I said you would probably be more likely to catch a hit show, or if you hear a show that's being talked about, like, oh, as a way of yeah. discovering new work. Like, yeah. Mm -hmm. I just, yeah. Like trying to the first stuff that I did in the Bay Area was self-produced. So I self produced a solo performance. I got involved in a theater company with friends I went to college with, a uh, sketch comedy group, um, and wrote stuff with them, performed with them. That evolved into them producing one of my uh, earlier full length plays, the Ben and Paul, that was a, was a hit show. <laughs> yeah. And that's, those are all, it was it's some, a very self motivated, self produced origin pushed me out, out into the world. In the beginning, much more successfully than, than sending the script to people. So mm -hmm. sometimes I think it's getting and getting up on its feet um, is is a, a, a really a, effective way for people to find out about. Uh, I think work. that's that's been my experience too. That being self motivated to work with we, we, just before thinking about oh I want this big theater to do my play, but we're trying to just work with other artists that you really like, you know, that you match with. Some that whose work excites you, and kind of starting with that, in my experience, is often what leads you to kind of expanding those relationships to be more about productions and more about those bigger career things. Um, but for me, I just you know worked with a lot of the same people in New York for years and years, and we had a playwrights collective called 13P that became known, and kind of as a group, we all sort of um, met people. And so, but it all started with with a bunch of unknown writers who just liked each other and liked hanging out. Something we've um, wrestled with is this idea of submissions, and a lot of a lot of people aren't doing submissions, and it, and, and it makes that makes a lot of sense. Um, well, we decided to continue to take submissions. Um, it definitely helps to have been to our theater and know the kind of work that we do. Um, we we've actually um, started having a, 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 a fee, um, and there are two reasons for that. One is we we're, we're paying our literary. Um, uh, uh, for their for their time, and and we also want you to think before you click send. Mm -hmm. we, we don't want it we don't want it to be too easy because a lot of people do, don't don't um, read, even read our mission and just send their very conventional um, realistic play, which might be wonderful, but it's just it's not not in our mission, and so it doesn't make sense for us to us to read it. But we 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 just I mean we could very easily go to no submissions, but. I, I keep holding on to it because we've we've actually um, we've done a number of plays that were playwrights' first professional productions, and I'm very proud of that. Um, and that's part of what you know what I like doing. Um, I think it's great to give give a young playwright a, a, a production and then see them go and and, and and do more stuff all over the country. Um, and um, also, um, we, we have you know a lot of people who submit to us and actually wind up working with us are people that have been coming to the theater, who know our work, and um, know what we're going to do well, and, and so it's it's a good match because they they know us. But um, you know, ever, there are a number of people who we've just found blind. Just they they submitted and it was a great play. So, but I do agree that I mean I, I think it has been a, so you can submit to us. But I think the other thing is find here um, uh, a director who's not an artistic director, a freelance director needs a project, and, and you know see if um, 
that director will do a, um, a reading in, in her or his um, living room with some actors and just let you let you hear it out loud and that, that could be the beginning of a relationship and that then, then at least you move then, then at least you're not that's much more satisfying than sending it. It just getting a bunch of people together and hearing it out loud, I always think it's great and, and it's good for you, but it's also good for getting a number of you know so, someone in that group will probably wind up believing in the play and start talking about it. So that's another thing to think about. Yeah. We've got ten minutes left, so a couple more questions. I just want to add briefly oh. to that. So um, return your your question. Unless it was a commission, um, I wouldn't. Not, I would myself never write a play that I thought, would, thought an artistic director would love, um, because I feel that a good artistic director will love a really bold original voice, right? Um, so I would say, write what you're dying to write, and then I mean it's kind of repeating now, but what people said, but write what you're dying to write and then find the, the partners that that want to. And it, it may take a while, you know. I, I, I think it was seven years from my first draft of Christy Quitters in the production. It's a long time. Also, um, in terms of local resources, I spent a lot of my 20s taking class, playwriting classes at Playwrights Foundation yep. with Marcus Gardley, um, Miguel <coughs> Cruz, Octavio Solis, Julie Jensen, Arthur Copen, I can't remember who else, quite a few. And um, I definitely got on Amy Mueller's radar that way, but also I got to know other local writers and I got to know these very well-established writers who have national reputations. And um, you know, I applied for the Jerome Fellowship at the Player Center in Minneapolis when I was in yeah, grad school, and I didn't get it, but I was a finalist. And who was on the um, selection committee was um, Miguel La Cruz, and we hung out also after, after um, you know, like after hours after, after class, and um, and also playground. If you're not involved, that's also a very, very, very um, accessible opportunity to have your work seen. That's a great idea too. I think. Obviously, the uh, Playwrights Foundation takes submissions for the festival, and I'm sure they would take a submission for the residencies. And the resident playwrights of these four classes have often taught these classes too that Andrew's referring to. So that offers another opportunity to have some income. And um, in the uh, Playwrights Foundation does offer, I mentioned the stipend. It's not big, but it is $500. And we're also funded by the Kenneth Raynan Foundation, in part, and also uh, by Shacker. So I do want to mention that we do have some funding from that. Let's get another question. Yes. Um, so it seems like right now there's a fair amount of attention from funders for these residency programs. Do you anticipate that will go away, or if it, you know, will this Mellon program, the pilot program, renew? And if it doesn't, will you keep the residency programs, or do you think there's other ways to support them? Our residency program isn't going away, but it's not really funded by anybody right now. Um, we did apply for an NEA grant for it. We have applied for grants from other funders here locally. Um, what I would like to be able to do with it if it were funded is to increase the stipend that we're paying to our playwrights. We pay our commissioned playwright um, uh, $5,000, but our resident playwrights, um, it just depends on funding. The first year it was funded by Theater Bay Area's cash program, um, and I think we paid everybody a stipend of what was it, like 375 Essentially, we wanted to set it up so that um, playwrights didn't lose any money um, so, and, and I actually had a playwright fight with me saying, that's too much money, I've never been paid for a residency. I'm like, I'm asking you for a year of work. $375 is not too much money. But it paid for their transportation back and forth. We paid for all the photocopying, paper, all that sort of stuff. Um, the second year we paid everybody $500. Um, we asked for enough funding to pay everybody $2,500 for the, the next season, but we'll find out about that. Um, I think that the benefits of the, of the residency program are so profound for our theater company that it would make me cry if it had to go away. Um, the infrastructure that the company needs to truly support the resident writers is something that's not funded, and eventually we will burn out if we can't fund it properly. 
but uh, right now it's it's so rewarding that uh, we, we definitely have plans to keep it going for the foreseeable future. Uh, my hope is to keep it going and expand it, actually, is, is the hope. Um, you know, I'd like to keep Peter on staff for the next 10 years, so who knows? Yeah. That is my hope, actually, because I want to keep him in the Bay Area. I don't want to lose him to New York or L.A. Um, and I've invested in him, and I want to continue that relationship. Um, and again, in expanding, I would love to see us have two, three playwrights um, at any given time be in residency. And on that same note, you know, I see Elizabeth here. If there are other playwrights in this room, I just finished working with Kate Ryan on this uh, last hundred days project. Woo! <laughs> so it's that last night. Um, but you know, we do. I open our doors are open to the public and to the playwrights and to the artists. I want them to be revolving doors. Um, we do a lot of around the table readings, in house readings. We open it up to the, the community at night for readings. Um, so there's really other opportunities besides this more formal residency that we're talking about um, to have your, your work heard and to participate within the organization. Um, so I would look at those opportunities and our doors are open. Yeah, and your doors are open. I mean, you really put your money there. I have done, as a director or dramaturg, done so many informal readings at Z Space that it's really a home for not just Bay Area playwrights, but Bay Area theater makers. Time for the doors closed, <laughs> but you ring a buzzer. Let you in. But I would also just say that it is, I mean it's I don't know if it is a fad or not, but like with funders, it seems that residencies are very popular right Foundations looking to support them, and not just Mellon, but you know, like and the National New Play Network has a very robust residency program um, with their 26 member theaters all over the country. And um, I feel like every uh, you know it hit a point where everyone was realizing that the current system of doing things was not was not um, working very well for at least for playwrights. It was kind of the but you know and so I, I feel like that's. I think there's a lot of people talking about it, thinking about different ways to do it, and not just playwrights specifically. You know, there used to be resident companies of actors all over the place too, and, and then they got, then they went away, and I think I feel like everyone's missing that. Yeah. So, mm -hmm. I mean, I think a, a lot of this is in response to that great book, um, Outrageous Fortune. I, I think that that kind of let everybody know how little actors are being paid. I, I think someone needs to write a book called. Uh, crappy actor salaries and, and oh. then we can get the foundations um, because it, it took it, it it took that book to make foundations realize that I mean it, it, it's a to people in the outside world it's a shock how little artists are paid. So I mean and and I think that put everybody's focus on um, playwrights, but I think um, I, I think all our artists need to be paid paid more and I think I think people are starting to um, get get the message and, and realize how, how little um, actors, directors, playwrights, designers are all paid. And, and so I, I hope that this is the, the next trend with foundations to, to really try to get um, actors, made, I mean, uh, all um, theater artists making a living wage. Yeah. Um, Jeanette at Alter mm -hmm. Theater has also really made every effort to pay everyone all the time, mm -hmm. um, it sort of across the board, even if it's commensurate salary. So I, I yeah, have to yeah. say that. We like to say we pay everybody equally unwell for their work. <laughs> <laughs> so with that, we, uh, we're going to wrap up. It is 4.30. Um, can we give a round of applause to our <laughs>